personal if you want to. Okay, so the main topics I'm going to cover today is first uh, looking at the Lindlar master equation, which we already looked at the lecture, but I'm going to show you, uh, guide you through an alternative way to derive it. Um, just using, considering like very small um, periods of time and then expanding a channel over that small period of time. Uh, and secondly, we're going to consider one very natural situation and um, natural evolution of a quantum system uh, where it's being measured according to some probability distribution and um, then we'll derive an blood in that. So this is a good way to see its physical meaning. Uh, and thirdly, as Ralph also advertised in the lecture, we're going to look at this uh, case of generating entanglement with a very simple thermal machine. So first, uh, the Mbladian uh, evolution. So the Mbladian master equation is used to describe the evolution of a quantum system, which interacts with a big environment, such that um, the interaction of the system with the environment is very slow compared to the uh, own evolution of the environment, and that the environment is big enough so that we can uh, completely discard it uh, while considering the evolution of the system. Okay, first to, uh, to start our derivation, let's just look at the, uh, even not, uh, the system not interacting with the environment, but just the system evolving under some Hamiltonian. And this, this derivation you, would, uh, you should be familiar with, so this is just uh, uh, how we extend the Schrodinger equation to density matrices. So say that we have system S, which is evolving under some Hamiltonian H, then the state of the system S is described by some density matrix rho, and the state uh, of the system at time T plus delta T is simply given by its uh, unitary evolution under the Hamiltonian H for the time delta T. So we have this exponential rho of T to the power H delta T. So now to obtain a differential equation for the uh, density matrix, we'll simply expand um, this expression in terms of its Taylor series up to the first order in delta t. So then the first exponential will just give us this g, the second exponential will give us this. Okay. And now we throw away all this term, all the terms here which correspond to delta t squared, so it's this one term. And then we are left with the following uh, rho of t uh, minus i commutator of h rho uh, delta t plus o of delta t. Or is it correctly to write O of delta T squared? Oh, is yeah, oh, is confused, let's see. It's just the term, so here is just the terms of the order of delta T squared. Okay, and now we just uh, take rho of T on the other side and divide everything by delta T and take the limit of delta T going to zero, which means that on the left-hand side, let me change this. We just have the differential with respect to time. And on the right hind side, we just have minus i h rho. So this is uh, something we knew from before. 
just a differential equation for the density matrix of the system uh, evolving entirely under this Hamiltonian. Okay. Uh, and here I did this derivation specifically with the Taylor expansion because this is the tool we're gonna use to derive the uh, differential equation in the case of the open systems. So now we add another system environment. So now the big state uh, of the system and environment jointly lives in the Hilbert space uh, HS then the product HE. And as I said, the, the environment is much uh, bigger than the system. This is one of the conditions to derive this equation. And uh, after it interacts with the environment, and we still assume that the joint interaction is described by a unitary under some Hamiltonian, uh, joint Hamiltonian uh, HSE, uh, the state of the system can be written as, so we act with this unitary on the joint state. E dagger, and then we trace out the environment. Uh, yeah, so here of zero, and this is for the time t. Okay, and given a bunch of approximations, as I already mentioned, the approximations include system much smaller than the environment, uh, the interactions of the environment with the system are much slower than whatever happens in the system, and all correlations created in the environment by interaction with the system, they uh, die very fast, so much faster than the uh, interaction of the environment with the system. Uh, under these assumptions, we can say that this is actually uh, just a, a quantum channel or a TPCPM map. So it's always a, yes. So basically, well, what uh, so the, all the assumptions I listed to you are a requirement to say basically that all the uh, future interactions of the system with the environment are not dependent on the, on the previous interactions of the system with the environment and are not dependent on the state of the or the previous on the previous state of the environment. So environment is something very big with which the system interacts with, uh, and somehow like the. Uh, the evolution of the environment is not relevant to us. So for example, I think Ralph also gave this example in the lecture, so you have a cup of coffee um, standing in a big room, for example, here on a table, and then you can describe um, the thermodynamics of the coffee itself as, oh, it's cooling down, and this will be a definite thermodynamics. But in considering that process, you don't need to uh, take into account that, oh, the, the air in the room will, uh, will heat up because the room is so big that this, this change is so insignificant compared to the uh, cooling process happening in the coffee. Does it make sense? Essentially, yes. We just we just want to consider how environment affects the system in like in a small periods of time, and then we we, we don't have to uh, condition it on the state of the environment at any times. Yes. Um. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. I, I'm, I, so I, I will not be able to give you a concrete example of such equation at this moment. Uh, but one can imagine that, for example, if, uh, if your environment, if the dimension of your environment is uh, comparable to the dimension of your system, then of course you cannot cannot use this this type of equation because then, um, like you, your your interaction could uh, impact the environment enough so that this Markovian assumption of oh we don't want to condition on the previous states uh, would be satisfied. Yeah, and uh, the bunch of assumptions that I just I just named, like if you if you ever encounter them in the literature, they're usually called uh, born mark of born mark of approximation, born approximation, and also the rotating wave approximation. So just for their, uh, just to note, if you ever see them. Okay. Okay. So now what we're gonna do is. We're just gonna take this channel and we're gonna evolve our system for a small time delta t. So then this is epsilon of rho s of t uh, for a small time delta t. And because this is a quantum channel, I can write it in terms of its Krauss representation with the Krauss operators, AK. Okay, and now is the time when we do a particular trick to, this, uh, to these Krauss operators and we rewrite them in the following manner. So we choose one of them which we label A0 which we rewrite as identity plus delta t L0 minus IK. Uh, and the rest of the Krauss operators, we just rewrite that as LK square root O delta t. Okay, so the conditions for these operators clearly are the LKs, uh, L0s and L0 and K have to be bounded because uh, the original cross operators are bounded. But moreover, we also uh, choose L0 and K such that L0 and K are Hermitian. And we can always do so because, in fact, you can uh, always um, decompose an arbitrary operator as some Hermitian operator plus I some Hermitian operator. So this is completely allowed. And we'll see why we decompose them in such a, such a manner in a moment. Okay, so now we just take these uh, uh, new versions, written versions of our cross operators and substitute them in our equation for the channel. So basically it will have two terms, right? A0 uh, rho s A0 dagger uh, plus A k rho A k dagger for all k's non equal to zero. So there's this first massage, uh, we just A zero rho s A zero dagger. Again, we'll be throwing out all the terms corresponding to delta t squared. Um, So let's try it for delta t zero minus i k rho s delta t plus delta t l zero 
that's okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, then what we are left with, so the term corresponding to the product with these two terms, we throw it out because it's delta T squared. Uh, what we're left with is just L rho S delta T L zero minus I K rho S plus uh, rho S delta T L zero plus I K. <coughs> and this one can write as rho S of T plus delta T here we have the anti-commutator of L0 and rho. And then we also have a commutator, I by commutator of K, oh, sorry, rho S, K. Okay. Very good. Uh, and now this term, this term is very easy to write because these are just proportional to LKs with a coefficient delta square root of delta T. Uh, so these are just sum over uh, K not equal to zero, uh, delta T, LK, rho S, LK dagger. Okay, now we take this one and this one and again write the state of the system S at T plus delta T. So from this part I get rho S of T plus delta T L zero rho S plus I rho S K. Um, and from here, I also get delta T, somewhere K not equal to zero, LK, rho S, LK dagger. Okay, and now we do the same trick, uh, we find we basically take rho s to the left hand side, uh, divide everything by delta t, take delta t to zero. And what we find is that is a differential equation for the state of the system s. So this is gonna be, uh, here I write minus i k rho s plus uh, l zero rho s plus s lk dagger. Okay, uh, now let us compare it to uh, the case with the unitary evolution where we had, and here we had basically a similar um, differential equation, but without all these uh, L0 and LK terms, which basically gives us uh, a hint that we should choose that actually K is just the Hamiltonian of the system. Okay, and this is still not, not the form of the Lindbladian that we've seen before, but actually, uh, there is a way to exp to find how L zero is expressed through the uh, through the rest of the L case, and for that you just need to use that the trace of rho s, since it's a density matrix, is always one, which means that the derivative of the trace is zero for all rho s, which means that the trace of of the 
the right hand side here is always zero. And from that, uh, you can infer because the trace of this commutator is zero, because the traces of commutators are zero, um, you're only left with this one and this one. And here you can permute the, uh, using the uh, trace cyclicity. Uh, you will get that L0 is in fact minus one half sum over k, lk dagger lk. And substituting this L0 into uh, an expression here will give you the, uh, the usual form, yes. Uh, not, not, the, not the two terms, but just this term. Because it's a commutator, so if you take a trace of a commutator of any two operators A and B, this is just the trace of AB minus trace of BA. But these are these traces are equal due to trace cyclicity property. So then it's zero. Okay, so basically this is uh, one of the ways to come to the, uh, and derive the Lindblad equation for, for the evolution of an open system. Uh, so let me do just one <coughs> example to show some intuition about it and see how we can actually compute the the state of the system in time. Uh, so let us take system S uh, qubit. Um, and say that I want to write some evolution um, it, it interacts with the environment. I can write it as an Lindbladian. Um, and I want an evolution to be such that in the limit of uh, t going to infinity, uh, the system will find itself in the ground state. So what would be your intuition uh, about the Lindblad operators in this case? So I have a qubit uh, which starts in any initial state. And in the end, I wanted to, um, to come to the ground state in the limit of infinite time. Yes. Yes, exactly. No, actually we only need it to, to jump from one to zero because we want it to end up in a zero and we, if you also include the jump from zero to one, there will be a non-zero population at, at the state one as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so here in fact, indeed, we just need one uh, operator, say I will also add the strength of this jump as lambda or square root of lambda. Uh, and this is a jump from one to zero. Okay, so now let us just uh, write down the, <coughs> the Lindblad equation for this, for this case. And see how the evolution goes. Ah, and for simplicity, let us assume that the Hamiltonian is zero. You can also work out the case with the non-zero Hamiltonian, but um, that doesn't really change the intuition. So then the differential equation I can write just as, um, it will be L1 rho L1 dagger minus, uh, yeah, of course, with a lambda minus lambda um, anti-commutator of L1 dagger L1 rho. Ah, 
Ah, okay, because I included lambda into into L. I will not write it here. So as Rolf said, sometimes like uh, we write the Lambladian uh, operators as just jumps, and sometimes we already include the strength of the jump in them. Uh, so lambda is just it will be some parameter. Okay, so uh, now let us calculate this. So basically, d rho by dt. Uh, let us assume that rho has some entries which we label as a, b, c, and d. Uh, then l1 rho l1 dagger will be basically your one row one zero. So basically what it does, it takes the diagonal element at one one and projects it onto to zero zero. And here, oh, I forgot one half. Um, we get lambda over two. So L1 dagger L1 will be uh, one one. And here I have a commu uh, anti commutator of one one and rho. And the anti commutator of one one and rho, one can show that this is just zero b c two d. Okay, so now, and this one, as I said, it just will be uh, d zero zero zero. Okay, this means that the time derivative of this matrix can be written as, so here we'll have lambda d minus lambda over 2b minus lambda over 2c minus lambda d. Okay, and then you can solve this uh, this equation uh, because basically you have now uh, a differential equation for this term, for this term, and for one of these terms. You can choose which one because they're dependent on each other. And uh, then you'll find that the final state uh, solution that you will get is the following. Because here, for example, the differential equation for the off diagonal term would be just dc by dt is uh, minus lambda over 2c, it will correspond to exponential decay. And similarly to this, for this term and so on. And the uh, term for 0, 0 population could just be found as 1 minus the term for 1, 1 population. So here we will have two uh, B C and indeed in a time limit of T going to infinity, the only term that survives is this one. Okay. So, kind of the conclusion to draw from this is that sometimes when you have the Lambladian, uh, by looking at the, sometimes by looking at the jumps that Lambladian has, you can already infer something about uh, its dynamics and the asymptotic limit. Okay. Uh, do you guys want a break or? You don't want? Okay. Fine. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. So, um, as you remember, actually in derivation on Ablodian there, we, we did use the property that the trace of the matrix is a constant, which means that uh, the trace of whatever is on this, uh, whatever is on the right-hand side of the master equation should always be B0, which in fact uh, exactly ensures that the sum of these two uh, is zero. Yeah. Uh, yeah, indeed, if we specify D, we specify A by default, yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. Now, now will be a fun exercise. So, um, let us now consider a following scenario for which we'll try to derive a Lindblad equation. Uh, so we have a system S, which most of the time um, evolves unitarily under some Hamiltonian HS. But from time to time, it undergoes instantaneous interactions with the environment. And these instantaneous interactions are given by um, some map, let's say epsilon, which is can be written in its Krauss representation. So just the usual TPCPM map. Uh, what's important is that the times of interaction are determined by a probabilistic process with the waiting time distribution omega of t, uh, which is the Poisson distribution. So it's gamma e to the power minus gamma t. So you can physically, you can imagine that, for example, you have uh, you have some radioactive material, and it emits uh, the emits the uh, emits particles, which you detect. And for these radioactive material, usually the the probability of uh, the particle uh, being emitted at time t is given by this exponential uh, Poisson distribution. And whenever whenever this emission happens. Uh, this system undergoes uh, some interaction with the environment. So now the question is, uh, how do how do I describe uh, this kind of uh, dynamics of a system? So, if you have any ideas, yes. Yes. Yeah, indeed. We'll need to find the average state of the system, uh, but let's let's think a bit simpler right, without Monte Carlo. So, again, um, I have the system the system S at, at time t, and then I want to see what happens. Uh, what is the state of the system at time uh, delta t? And I want to average over different events, right? And also, I choose delta t. In the end, I'll choose delta t going to zero, right? Which means that, uh, in principle, uh, I will only account for one possible interaction happening. And the probability of this interaction is, in fact, given by uh, gamma delta t, because this is a Poisson distribution which means that the probability of the event happening in, um, in the small time period delta t is gamma delta t. And it's very Im important uh, that this, this probability is not dependent on time. Uh, because only in that case, in fact, we can ensure that the Markovian approximation is met. So Poisson distribution is uh, this one distribution, which is memoryless in that in that sense. So then, with this probability, uh, this map is applied, and with probability one minus gamma delta t. So the rest 
uh, the evolution is just the unitary. So. So everything we write here is just to the first order of delta t. So in the end, this I will also write to the first order as I did before. Okay, so now let us simply massage the second, the, yeah, the right hand side, the second term in there. The epsilon we just write in terms of the channel. And here, what we will have is one minus this. And here we have rho s. Um, already throwing out everything of the, of the second order, just row S on delta T. Yeah, and here I see T squared. I can massage this further, which means that I can write following uh, delta t plus rho s uh, minus uh, gamma rho s delta t uh, minus i h s rho s delta t. Okay, and now we again do the trick. Uh, we put rho s on the left hand side, divide everything by delta t, and take delta t limit to zero. And what we get is the differential on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we obtain the usual uh, unitary evolution, which is amended by our dissipator. Dagger minus gamma rho s. And this gamma rho s exactly corresponds to uh, just massaging the term of a sum over k, a k, a k dagger, rho, uh, because a k's are the Krauss operators, so they need to sum up to, so a k dagger, a k needs to sum up to identity. And so basically, uh, this is one way to, to uh, to see special cases of the of the Lindblad equation, where you just turn on interactions with the environment according to this probability distribution, with the rate, uh, with the average rate, one over gamma. Or no, the rate the rate is gamma, but the time the average time uh, between two interactions is one over gamma. So this is rate. This is average time. Yeah, and in the end of analyzing this, you get the Lindblatian. Uh, for this reason, in fact, Lindblatians are also used to study um, uh, systems which undergo uh, many interactions with the environment, many successive interactions, which are given uh, by some probability distribution. So these are, for example, collision models or um, 
or um, something of that type. And then a uh, more rigorous way to deriving or deriving this type of equations is considering uh, a state, say some state rho s, uh, given that uh, exactly n plus one collision happened, so n plus one interaction happened, and writing it as an integral over, over probability of application of this map to the uh, state where exactly n interactions happened, uh, multiplied by like some evolution, uh, unitary evolution for time, delta t. Uh, multiply by probability that no interaction happened for this small time delta t. And then you in integrate over these delta t, over, yeah, over these delta t's. And then you take the derivative of this expression and essentially then you get uh, a differential equation. And then to obtain the rho s, uh, you just sum up over all, all possible numbers of collisions. So this is a more general picture. Uh, there are some papers on this. Uh, if you look up quantum collision models, uh, which go into a bit more detail in mathematics about it and also uh, thermodynamic implications of such models, but uh, this is not necessary to know, but just to, to have in mind this picture of uh, probabilistic interactions, so to say. Okay. Still, no break, doing good. Okay, then let's just uh, finish with our last generating entanglement thermal machine. Okay, here I'll just describe briefly the setting uh, and the results. And this is based by a paper, uh, on a paper by Markus Huber, Nicolas Brunet, uh, Geraldine Haag, these are people working on quantum thermodynamics in Vienna and also in Geneva. And the thing with this paper and also with the exercise is that uh, to derive the exact expressions that you'll see uh, in the paper, uh, I would recommend you to use some tool like MATLAB or Mathematica because they're a bit heavy. So I will, I will not do it here. Uh, and also I don't recommend you to do it yourself on the paper unless you're feeling particularly masochistic with, with how you like your calculations. So, which is a fair thing to do. Like I, I like to do that sometimes, so. Okay, so the setting is the following. We have two qubits with the same energy gap, E. And one of them is coupled to, sorry, both of them are coupled to baths. And the temperature of one bath is bigger than the temperature of the other and that bath we'll call a hot bath, and the second we'll call, we'll call cold bath. And also the qubits we'll call then C and H, by how they, by um, which bath they're coupled uh, to respectively. Okay, and uh, Qubits start out in some uh, in some initial states, and what happens is the following. So first, uh, these two qubits are constantly uh, evolving under the interaction Hamiltonian, 
which can be written as, so G is some strength of interaction. Uh, so if, if, the, if the first qubit uh, goes from one to zero, the second goes from uh, zero to one, and the Hermitian conjugate of this, which is just the opposite. Okay, so they're kind of exchanging populations on these levels. Okay. Uh, right, that is green. Yeah. Uh, okay. But from time to time, what happens is that they, they couple to their respective paths. So, uh, and th they thermalize and they reset to a thermal, to a respective thermal state. And the probabilities of these events are quite low, but they still non-zero. And um, then the general evolution, the total evolution of the state of these two qubits can be written as the following uh, master equation. So d rho by dt, here we have our usual say that the individual Hamiltonians of these two uh, sum up to some H zero. Then this is the total Hamiltonians, just H zero plus the interaction term. Okay. And then there is the dissipation part, which can be written as the sum of two terms. So the first term corresponding to the cold coupling of the cold qubit to the cold bath, which happens with probability PC, uh, described by this channel, uh, phi C acting on rho minus rho. And the channel and the action of the channel can be written as uh, mapping rho to, so the state of the cold qubit is reset to the thermal state. So of course, it's first decoupled from the hot qubit and reset to the cold state, and the state of the hot qubit remains the same, which means that we just trace out the cold part from the rho. Okay. And the second term corresponds to the similar process happening to the second qubit, but with probability pH. And here phi H does the same essentially. Maps rho to we decouple the hot qubit and the state of the cold qubit is the same. Okay. So now there are several things to find out. Uh, first one is what is the steady state of this equation? And the steady state you just find from, uh, yeah, the zero dt equals to zero. Uh, these are just two qubits. Um, so the total ma matrix, size of the matrix row will be just four by four. So Mathematica can handle that at least. <laughs> so, uh, so first you find the steady state, uh, and the steady state will of course depend on PC, pH, uh, G, and also the temperatures of the cold bath and the hot bath. I mean, you can use T or you can use beta, doesn't matter. And then what we're gonna look at uh, is the entanglement of that steady state.
And to assess the entanglement of the steady state, we're going to use so-called concurrence, which is, uh, yeah, which is basically one of the measures of the entanglement for mixed states. Uh, I think it's particularly for, yeah, it's particularly for two qubits. If you have two qubits which are together in a mixed state, uh, this is a way to um, assess their entanglement, how entangled they are. Uh, and it has a sort of complicated definition, which doesn't give you much intuition about how it's constructed. But it basically is max between zero and also lambda one minus lambda two minus lambda three minus lambda four, which are the eigenvalues um, of a matrix rho, which depends um, which you construct using so matrix R, which you construct using matrix rho, and also rho um, rho tilde, and rho tilde is constructed from rho by acting uh, with y operations on both qubits. Again, this was this was introduced by uh, Wouters. I link the uh, I link the citation of the paper in the in the exercise to the exercise sheet, uh, and this this is proven to uh, to um, quantify the entanglement for the for the states of two qubits. Unfortunately, uh, not much intuition can be read from just looking at the definition. So. It's just uh, some measure which mathematically performs well. And then the idea is that uh, you take this uh, you take this measure, you input your uh, your state rho, you calculate these eigenvalues of the matrix, um, and you get the value of the entanglement. And then, uh, importantly, you look at the several. Um, Borderline cases. So I think one borderline case is when the temperatures of the cold bath and a hot bath are the same. Uh, in that case, in fact, uh, the steady state will always be separable. So you can always write it as a tensor product of the states and the individual, individual systems. And in that case, of course, your entanglement will be zero. But uh, in other cases, for example, uh, one limiting case is when we take the temperature of the hot bath to infinity and the temperature of the cold bath zero. So kind of the extreme case. And in that case, uh, the entanglement will not be zero between two systems. Uh, it will still be not, uh, like the entanglement that you generate is not uh, uh, extraordinary in, in amount, but there is still some, so. Okay, but generally looking at this exercise gets you a bit more familiar with several things. So first, yeah, how these, uh, how you operate with these two qubits connected to baths, how you write, uh, in general case, the process of uh, thermalization with with particular probability. Uh, it's one more MOS equation. It also teaches you that sometimes to do calculations, especially in thermodynamics, uh, you need Mathematica or MATLAB. even for two qubits, so it's a sad truth. Okay, I think this is everything I wanted to say for today. So yeah, if you have any questions, feel free. But otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>